also pretty cool in case you, what you maybe not know, behind this app there's actually a small .NET application running in a data center in London. Uh, and what we actually do, because obviously we are Dynatrace and we know how to monitor applications, we actually monitor this application with Dynatrace. And if you would do me a favor, please turn down your data volume, meaning if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, maybe just stop because I want to just quickly show you this is actually what we capture from the live system. So we have, uh, in the last six hours, we had people coming in from like end users using either desktop browser or mobile. We also have some robots running, so we also monitor our system. And then we can see how this request get from to the IIS web server. Then we have actually a, uh, a clustered uh, ESP.NET environment, and that goes to the SQL server and also to our this is gomez.com. That's our load, our synthetic monitoring. So when you enter the URL, it actually makes a REST call out to this service to actually uh, execute the tests. And what I really like, and let me just see, because I also tweeted about this, and let's see how fast the data connection is now. Let's see actually who is, ex who is using the service. So you can actually see in the last six hours, we have people mainly coming in from obviously here, but we also have people from Europe and somebody from the US. Most people, however, come in from Cape Town, and what's really cool, I can now right-click drill down to every individual one of you. And again, please be a good uh, data bandwidth user. Because I'm now actually connecting to our Dynatrace server that, is, that runs also in the London data center. And there are some people that had a frustrating experience, it seems. Tomek, advanced mobility. You had a frustrating experience? Or are you frustrated? <laughs> I want to know why. First of all, it took you th <laughs> of course, that's right. <laughs> that's good. Typically, I make jokes on people, but if you do it to the audience, perfect. So, yes, you're using a BlackBerry, and you had a click on submit, uh, which took 3.3 seconds on your device. It took 50, uh, 500 milliseconds on our server implementation but it's indicated frustrated as red. Why? I guess because, let's see, drill down to our pure paths. And if I now, ah, validation error. Oh, okay, what did you do? So this is actually the submit <laughs> step <laughs> where I can see that our ASP.NET code tried to, you know, obviously enter something in probably in the database. And if I click on details, if I scroll down, it was an HTTP post on that URL blah, 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 and let's see, location, validation error. Sorry, but we can't let you enter the challenge without accepting the, you probably forget the checkbox. <laughs> see? <laughs> so that's kind of, I guess that's why I love Dynatrace, obviously, because we get this full end-to-end -end visibility for every single user, and I had a conversation outside and somebody said, well, why would you turn this on in production all the time? You just need it for error detection, but I don't know when somebody with a Blackberry comes in. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it has to be on all the time. And then I can do cool things like, you know, figuring out what's going on. I can see things like ex uh, all the database statements being executed. I could figure out, let's see if this actually, yeah, it's a little slow now. Yeah, I, I, I I'll show you some more examples later. But just to let you know, we got you covered. In case you have a problem, I know what the problem is, whether it's browser related or because it was an end user issue or something else. Okay. So let me go to my next presentation, which was the one that I had initially uh, submitted for this conference. And I actually gave the presentation last week at Java One in San Francisco, which by the way, who, who was ever, has everybody, anybody ever been there? Yeah, one, two, four. So 9,000 Java people and 50,000 Oracle world people make it six, almost 60,000 people in San Francisco. It's crazy, but it's really interesting. So they had like, I don't know how many thousand sessions they had. It was very cool. Uh, I talked about deep dive performance mistakes and just so you understand my next slide, if you are presenting at an Oracle conference and you are an Oracle employee, the first slide you have to put up is a safe harbor statement saying, I'm an Oracle employee and all the stuff that I basically tell you now is something confidential, blah, blah, blah. 
And I thought, obviously, I'm not an Oracle employee, but I want to play part. I want to be just as good as they. And so I went online and searched for safe harbor. And that's what I found. That's my safe harbor. So I guess it seems that when you have a lot of money, you want to dump it into the United States and not into the Gulf of Mexico, where all the money goes to waste. So my safe harbor statement. Uh, also, obviously, I'm biased. You know that I'm working for a company. Uh, I guess I proved myself in the morning that the stuff that I teach you and show you, you can do with any tools. This was actually a screenshot or a picture that I took from a presentation from a guy called Fabian Lange. Uh, he did a presentation on Java profilers, uh, how profilers work, and he also said all the stuff that I teach you, you can do with any tool out there. Or most of most of the things you can do with with almost any tool. Uh, so just as a just a little list of tools that he was having up there. Uh, in case you are looking into profiling, tracing, performance management tools, that's a huge list. Also, one thing that I had to present is there is the door, or there is the door, in case you think this session is about optimizing your code from 0.02 milliseconds to 0.01 milliseconds. Most of the problems, and as you've seen in the morning, are not really about optimizing like a, a, a bytecode instrumentation or a, by, a bytecode line. Uh, what I typically do is things like this. So here what I actually have, I look at the uh, execution pattern and the response time pattern of an application over time. And what we have here is a graph that I constantly look at and I get into more examples later. The color coding here is the time spent in a certain layer of your application, whether it's your web server tier, your Hibernate, your data access layer, your business logic. So I always look at the application in layers because then I can immediately see, oops, uh, here, Something happened in the red area. That was actually AGB, I believe. Uh, and what I also do, however, I, I, I correlate it with other metrics. So for instance, it's hard to read web request count. I figure out if the response time increase here related to maybe a denial of service attack or somebody hit our systems. No, it was not. Constant response time was interesting though here. That seems to be correlating the number of database queries being executed at, at that same time. So something happened in a database that probably slowed down these AGB calls. So this is already a way how I get to root cause, and that's what I do. Also, which I guess you've, you've figured out by now, if you look at applications, especially web applications, then there's the beautiful front end and the beast in the back. Uh, and I want to focus on both of them. Uh, even I gave you already some examples uh, in, the, in the morning on front end and back end. And I want to give you a little more. So where do the stories come from? I guess you figure it out by now. I look at real life scenarios. I always watch Twitter if there's another disaster that just happened, like United or healthcare.gov or somebody else is down. Or I also talk with people in our own user groups that we have at meetups, at conferences like here, and then get their stories. I also do what I call an online performance clinic. So I travel a lot, but I cannot be everywhere all the time, but I can be online all the time. And so every other week, like next Monday, I'm doing another clinic where I show how I analyze certain performance problems. You can join me online, you can ask questions, everything will be recorded and then we put out on my YouTube channel. I also have a program and that's actually where most of my stories currently come from, which is called Share Pure Path. Share your Pure Path. The data that we collect with our tool is called the Pure Path, the pure execution path, including down to the method level database statements. If you're not familiar with the tool, it could be very intimidating to look at this data. I do it every day, and I can typically find the problems within a couple of minutes because I know where to look at. And so I offer this as a service. If you have any pure path, any data captured with Dynatrace, and you have no clue what to look at, send it to me. On this URL, you get the description on how to export the data and how to send it to me via email. Okay? And for those folks that sign up for the Dynatrace personal license, the free trial, and that send me a pure path until tomorrow, 3 p.m., we have some t-shirts. That's the challenge that I want to raise out there. So send me pure paths of your apps, and then we'll get, we'll get, the, get the t-shirts. Just what does it take, what do you actually get? Uh, what I typically send back is PowerPoints, where in this case it was a, um, a PHP application that I analyzed. So not only do I do Java, I do Java, PHP, .NET, Node, all, all types of apps. And typically I respond back with a PowerPoint saying what is the high level analysis, and then screenshots with bullet points, and giving information on what I think is wrong and also show you how I navigate to the product. Okay, so hopefully benefit for both, for you and also for me because I have new stories to tell. 
I told you about my 80-20 rule already. 80% 80 of the problems are only caused by a very small number of problem patterns. And I love metrics, so nothing new. So now let's get into some new metrics and some new stories. Let's start with the front end. And here the thing is, the model, we are getting better, bigger. And um, I, I, as you know also by now, I also li always like to get a little image that kind of reflects or introduces the story that I'm going to tell. What do we see here? A room full of people and I guess the guy in the front is probably earning more money than the rest combined. He's the CEO, I assume. And he has a great idea. I think we may need a mobile strategy because he read it in one of his, one of his papers or maybe his yoga teacher told him that this is what he needs to do. <laughs> like the, have this, does anybody know uh, Silicon Valley, the sitcom? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> so anyway, he has a great idea. Well, maybe he's a marketing guy. And the guy in the back who is constantly checking his Facebook and Twitter, which I see a lot happening, like, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell this, but on Tuesday I was invited with a very large company to give a similar presentation, and we were like 10 people in the room, and eight of them were constantly on their phones. And I, st and I stopped and I said, so you invited me, and now you're sitting here and not even listening to me. It was the DevOps presentation I did in the morning. And I said, this is what DevOps is about. Listen to others what they have to say. And if you're not interested, then leave. Okay, first of all, it's disrespectful. And second, really, that's not what you're here for. That's not why, we, why you flew me in from Austria. What happens a lot though, if somebody has a great idea and uh, it has to be done yesterday, not today, then sometimes we push things through without really having a good plan. Okay, how often has this happened to you? We needed yesterday, we sold it a month ago. The first story is from uh, another company that is uh, sponsoring the American Super Bowl. And it is, where, do, where are the soda cans in here? Does anybody have a soda can? I see you have a soda can. Can you lift it up? What is it? It's a Coca-Cola. I'm not talking about Coca-Cola, I'm talking about the other company. They are sponsoring the Super Bowl every year. They have an awesome commercial. And uh, last year they had the grand idea, the marketing team, we want to be social. We want to show the world that we communicate and interact with our users, with our consumers. They assumed a lot of people will watch the Super Bowl in a setting like this, party somewhere in a bar or maybe at home. And what they wanted to do is they wanted them to take selfies, like I did now, selfies from my party, upload it to their website so that everybody else that sees the spot also goes online and sees the last 400 uploads of selfies in a 20 by 20 grid. Okay? Cool idea. Okay? Yeah, we still think it's a cool idea. <laughs> if the screen is big like this, but if this is your mobile strategy, if you look at this screen, 20 by 20 pixel or 20 by 20 images looks more like a little pixel party. You know, that's all, that all, that's all it is. Still a great idea, however, if I show you the next screen now, please focus on two numbers that I highlighted, which will tell you that this probably was just pushed through very quickly without really giving this a thought how to implement this. These are the metrics for downloading the mobile Pepsi page during the Super Bowl for my iPhone. So the way this was implemented, I had to download 20 megabytes of 434 images. Why 434? They're 20 by 20, it's 400, plus 34, some logos and something else, some company, blah, 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 anything. So the way this was implemented was in a quick and dirty way. And not the way I would do it. First of all, nobody knows what the last 400 uploads were. I can, I can run a batch job every five minutes that takes a random number of recent uploads and creates a thumbnail. And I created in three versions. A big one, high, high resolution for the big screen, a middle one for the tablet, and a small one for the iPhone. And then I delivered that exact picture. That reduces the number of resources by 399, and probably this size by 19 megabytes at least. That's much better than forcing my phone to download. The whole thing took tw two minutes to fully render. Why? Because the phone had to scale everything down through, sh uh, through uh, CSS. Doesn't make sense, right? And what I always tell, I'm traveling a lot and when I'm here, I have to pay 15 euros per megabyte. Okay? 
15 euros per megabyte, that's 300 megabytes to download the page, that doesn't really make sense for me on the phone. I got more examples. FIFA.com has been in the news for not only football recently. <laughs> Their largest element on the page during the World Cup was the FAF icon with 370 kilobytes. Okay? FAF icon is a little small icon on the top left, or if you pin the URL on your home screen, that's the logo. I was at a conference three weeks ago, SDPCon, great conference in Boston, testing conference. They use WordPress as their company at uh, the conference website. WordPress is great. The problem is the background image here was uploaded and everybody, whether mobile, tablet, or desktop, had to download that background image, which unfortunately is a little hard to see, 8.5 megabytes. Doesn't make sense. It took about half a minute to load that page just because the background image was so big. The lesson learned here for me is if you, have to if you have to implement something like that where people can upload large content and you then need to display that content, it makes a lot of sense to think about how do we need to display it. Maybe we need some thumbnails. If you run WordPress, there are obviously plugins that do all of this for you, but in this case, the guy who probably manages the website has no clue about web performance optimization. He just takes an image. The system should take care for him about these things. If you build software, you should want to build smart software. Uh, make F12 your friend. So for web performance optimizations, again, uh, hit F12 and you see um, all the stats very easily in the tool. Also, if you have no clue what is good and what is bad, is 10 images good or bad or is 100 images good or bad? There's a, there's a, a, a website called HTTP Archive. They are testing uh, one of the top one million websites in the world on a regular basis and then come up with statistics. How many, what's the page size of these pages? And this is a time graph, so we can see we're getting bigger and bigger on average. How many JavaScript files, transfer size, and all that. That's very interesting to get a reference point on what are the top one million websites doing out there. Also, metrics like how, how deep is the DOM, how many DOM elements, connections per page. So very interesting, hdbrcap.org. Now I know it doesn't make sense if you compare yourself with the top one million pages because you might be an e-commerce store and you don't want to be compared to the average of one million. So there's online services. Like if you go for instance on the Dynatrix website, you can enter your URL and you can say, I am in the finance industry or healthcare industry in South Africa. Then we compare you with the same, with similar websites in your industry and in your geography. And then you get a report back where it says, your website has on average 14 hosts, the, 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 the top 10 in your category are only five and the worst one on 51, uh, fif has 51 hosts involved. So that's maybe a little bit better. So compare yourself against your competition to get a ballpark. The metrics that I'm therefore looking at, similar to what I presented in the morning, number of resources, size of resources, and total size, nothing new. Tools, everything that is browser built in. I really like Yslow, it's a great extension to Firebug. Uh, also, PageSpeed. PageSpeed is from Google, has now also a, or has moved to uh, PageSpeed Insights online, so you can actually go to Google. So, uh, Google for PageSpeed Insights, and then you can enter your URL, and then they're testing it for you, and then they're also comparing it and giving the stats. Pretty cool stuff. And yeah, not do it manually, but also automate the hell out of it if you can do it, because most of these tools have the ability to also capture these metrics in an automated way when you execute your tests, and then at the end of a test, they say, 50 images loaded, 20 JavaScript files loaded, and then you feed this in into your build server and add it to your statistics. One other thing, front-end availability. Sometimes back another image from my most favorite soft drink company, online at least. This is the page when you click on, when you go to pepsi.at, the Austrian site, and you click on products, then you get a, a, a warning, or a, a page says, content was blocked because it was not signed by valid security certificate. If I'm the developer of this and they deployed it and now nobody can see my cool stuff because somebody messed up, it's not a good thing. So for availability or the, the, the category of availability, you've, you've seen this graph in the morning. If you're responsible for a website, make sure you have availability monitoring in there. And availability again does not mean I can ping the machine from the machine next to it, but from these points in the world where my users are from. Also, what I like a lot, this is a screenshot from Wiselow. Um, 
it shows you also, it gives you rules, uh, make few HTTP requests, use a content delivery network, and things like that. Uh, that obviously increases your availability as well if you're smarter with, with uh, content that you have on the page. Um, another interesting one from, again, this is Pepsi again. Pepsi is using uh, Amazon AWS uh, as their CDN, and if you go to Pepsi and you download the 400 something images that they have on there right now, most of them come actually back with a 503 error on Amazon with the status code, please reduce your request rate. That means they're using a service like Amazon, but Amazon doesn't deliver the images because they probably didn't buy a big enough package with Amazon. Or, obviously, because they're having so many images on there, maybe the developers made a mistake or something like that, and therefore they're exhausting their limits. Some tips and tricks, if you are building a service that is depending on third-party services out there and you have multiple choices, you know, there is maybe, I don't know, you maybe use a map service. You can choose between Google, between Bing, and somebody else. Then you hopefully make a smart choice on choose the tool, the service, that is most reliable. How would you know? There are services out there like isitdownrightnow.com that tells you which services are currently down and what is their history. And if you see that Google is always down, which fortunately it's not, but you know, it, depending on which service you look at, this allows you to make smarter decisions. The same is true for another service, it is called outageanalyzer.com. Same thing, it just shows you from the third parties uh, where they are not accessible. Yeah, usual suspects, okay. So, I wanna start with the usual and not so usual suspects. Um, and again, I always try to find a picture that uh, kind of represents the scenario and I hope Hopefully you've already started digesting your food because the next one is a little gross. What do we see here? <laughs> exactly, it's a perfectly functional toilet. It's just a little hard. I mean, as a guy, you can easily pee from the side. It's probably the other business is a little harder to do. So I think the architect who came up with this room to put the toilet in probably didn't make the smartest decision. Right? And I see this in the same way at, in software engineering, and I actually blame myself as well in my, in, in my history. In my first company I worked for, I started as a developer, and because I was with the lo company long enough, at some point in time they promoted me to architect because nobody else was there to do the, the, the architecture. But I had no clue about architecture. So I am sure I did the best in my intentions, but I probably made a lot of mistakes. And that might be true for you too. And it might be that you inherit code from somebody that thought he's an architect and had no clue about architecture. The next example is from an online room reservation system from a very large company from the great island of Great Britain. And they have, uh, 10 years ago, they have a subsidiary in the US, in Denver. Uh, and they had an intern hired 10 years ago to build a very simple application to make reservations to meeting rooms. So I could go online and I see my 10 meeting rooms in the office in Denver and I say I need this room from 12 to one. Simple, right? Perfect project for an intern, 10 years ago. 10 years later, this system is used throughout the company. The intern obviously no longer there. Somebody else took official responsibility. And the problem that they're facing right now is in order to open up that overview of rooms for a single location, it takes between one and two minutes, between 60 and 120 seconds to render, and to see very high garbage collection time on the servers. The first assumption that the now responsible developers had, probably some bad garbage collection tuning, and it has to be the database, because they looked into the, into the rendering code and they said the rendering is so simple, it has to be the database. It resulted in two years of finger pointing between Dev and the DBA. <laughs> and the DBA, he, he, he read a blog from me where I talked about database performance issues caused by bad database access patterns on applications. And he said, I read your blog, I want you to do a sanity check on my app. I have no clue about Java, but I read the blog and just figured it out. What he told me is, this is what his developers did. They basically, it's a simplified version of the method, obviously, but this is the room reservation report, this is the method load, uh, load data for office, and this is the rendering. And then the uh, timestamp here, timestamp there, and then, and then logging it out, right? Perfectly valid. It's a good, perfectly valid approach. 
what they came up with, they said, well, based on our data, this time here, it takes about 45 seconds on average. So it is definitely just a database problem. Joe, the database guy, however, said, if I look at my database tools, my database tools tell me every SQL statement executes faster than one millisecond. I cannot optimize anything there. So obviously the typical, I see it from this perspective, I see it from this perspective, and we totally look at the different things. So before I go into the next slide, because the next slide was actually what I sent him back uh, as, the online, as the performance review that I did, I actually just wanna go into the data that he sent me so that you can see how this looks like. So he sent me a set of pure paths. So what you see here, these are individual requests that he extracted from his production environment. And it's basically this uh, reservation report X HTML. I click on one of them. This one took 60 seconds. Uh, you can see here, a lot of time spent on CPU. The orange one is garbage collection. So when the garbage collector hits, uh, and then you know the JVM stands basically still, and there's a lot of I/O as well. On the bottom, this is the, the data that I sometimes say this can be very intimidating because there's a lot of data there. Okay. Um, what I always do is I start here, and this is the only view that I hope everybody in the world will soon know how to read. So this is what we call a transaction flow. This is basically how this request flows from left to the you from the user over Apache. Tomcat and then into the database. Let me zoom out a little bit. I know Richard, you have seen this last Monday, so you are not allowed to participate now. But can anybody tell me what you see and what, what is the obvious reason why this takes 60 seconds and what's wrong? Hmm? Yeah. There are 24,889 round trips to the database to show a report with five to 10 elements. Similar to the example that I had in the morning with my free trial report, where, they, where Hibernate went basically crazy. You only need to look at this number. Basically what happened, they loaded a shitload of data into memory, and then the garbage collector had to basically then clear everything up again. That's why there was so much CPU and garbage collection activity. Well, we could also tell them, and you can move the mouse over, and you can say, show me the database calls. So you can see all the database calls, all is here. Oops. Every single database call, and it, I guess you can see the pattern, which is interesting, right? This is the typical M plus one query problem pattern, the same SQL statement been executed thousands and thousands of times, just with a different ID. So now let me go back to the slides because I need to speed up a little bit. Um, And the animation slide shall start from here. So this was the situation. So what I sent him back is exactly the screenshot. I said, bad, bad, high CPU, high memory. I sent him this list and I said, well, it's a classical M plus one query problem. What was also interesting, and I had no clue about this, they were using Sybase. Does anybody use Sybase? No, okay, good. But <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting fact. Every time you take a connection out of the connection pool, Sybase JDBC driver calls set client name, basically the security context. And this was called 12,444 times. So what really happened, they were taking out the connection from the pool, executing a statement, handing it back. And this they did, they repeated 12,444 times, totaling up to 24,888. The individual database statement was actually really executing faster than one millisecond. Could also be observed from within the application if you would look at the right tools and if you me measure the right thing. The question is why did this happen? And then we did some digging. Uh, what you see here is the top list shows where most of the time is spent in which methods. And one of the top methods was the get method of the hash table. And if you click on this, then Diamond Trace shows you on the bottom a reverse call stack. Who is actually calling into the hash table? And what we figured out with some analysis is that the intern back then, he built his own OR mapper. 10 years ago, he had no clue about Hibernate. I'm not even sure if Hibernate was around. But he basically said, I'm building my entity objects and what I'm doing, every time somebody needs some data, I load the whole database into a hash table. 
build my objects around it. So every time somebody makes a get call to an object, it goes into the hash table. And at the end of the request, I'm throwing this hash table away. OK? Make sense? Well, it <laughs> functionally correct, architecturally, maybe not so good. Hmm? What was that? <laughs> Isn't that entity beans? Yeah. So, what I'm saying here is, you know, you may struggle with similar things because you've inherited code and you have no clue about it. So, therefore, lesson learned: don't assume you know what the code is doing you inherit, or know what the code is doing of the frameworks that you just downloaded from GitHub or from somewhere else without really <laughs> figuring out what they really do. Also, not, you know. Don't assume you're not making the same mistakes. And explore tools like uh, build the database analysis tools, logging options for certain frameworks such as Hibernate, we talked about this before, JMX counters, or any of the tracing tools that are listed here. <coughs> Key metrics, again, number of SQL calls, the number of same SQL statements. And the, the interesting thing about this is if you see the same SQL statement being executed on the same transaction, that's obviously the classical M plus one query problem. If you see the same SQL statement executed on multiple steps in your workflow, so the user goes to your homepage, logs on, clicks on step one, two, three, four, and you always query the same static amount of data, then it's a good candidate for caching instead of always fetching it from the database. Number of connections being used and also the roles and data transferred. That's always a good thing, okay? Remember adding this to the list of metrics as we talked in the morning, you can capture all these metrics when executing your unit tests. I don't need to have this in production and figure out that we're loading too much data. <laughs> it tells me that my pictures work. So <laughs> what I see a lot is that people think they can migrate to microservices. And you cannot migrate to microservices. We can we can architecture for a service-oriented architecture, right? Where is uh, the guy from the morning? Where's your boyfriend? <laughs> there he is, right? You have to architect for it and not just think you have a monolithic app and you are drawing a line here around an interface and take it and put it into a container and then scale the container. Next example is from a Swedish company. It is, they had a, a monolithic app so that means rendering and data access was all in one container and then they ripped it apart into a front-end component, rendering and the back-end service. What this company did, the service that they offered, they allowed every sports club in Sweden to register with them basically a sports club site, contact site. So if somebody like a dad with a kid says, I want to send my kid in Stockholm to a football club, they can say Stockholm football and they got a list back of 33 clubs with the address and the contact person. It's a very easy thing. Um, it took between one and two seconds on average to get that result list. After they migrated to microservice-oriented architecture, it took a little longer. And I'll show you again the screen, which you've seen before. This is the transaction flow. And I know some of the numbers are hard to read, so I'll just give you the first one. Instead of two seconds, it now took 26, 26 seconds to get the same 33 sports clubs in, Sweden, in Stockholm. What else do you see on this one? Remember, this is the front end that should do the rendering, and this is the back end service. And you're excluded because you saw it. Hmm? 171 DB calls, yeah. 33 front and to back end calls, okay. Yeah. So here's what I told him. First of all, I said, if this is your front end that is purely responsible for rendering, why do you make a call to the database? It's an architectural violation for me. Yeah. We looked at the database statements and what these six database statements actually did, they executed the query saying, give me all the IDs for the sports clubs that matched that, that query. 33 came back and for every single one, they executed a separate microservice service call. So that this service then went off to the database 
and had to in total execute 171 SQL statements. 140 of them about were always the same database statement because this service before it was executing the code, the logic, it had to go to the database and, kept and, and always query the same static configuration element. Okay. This is not microservice or service-oriented architecture done right. This is wrong. And the only thing you need if you're an architect and you want to review your code is to understand how to read this diagram. And what I also now try to do, I work a lot with the test community. Testers, whether they're doing manual or functional testing or automated testing, they typically look at just functional green. And just what I said in the morning, if we teach these folks, and also if you start with this, by looking a little bit more behind the scenes, then we can find these types of problems earlier. Okay. Another example is from, this, the first one was actually, if you noticed, the evil side, .NET, actually, but it happens in Java too, and here's, an, here's a Java example. In this case, this was actually uh, a service hosted within the same JVM that had the it used to be monolithic and then they ripped it apart, but they hosted the service in the same container. One request that came in took 1.1 minutes. It was a financial transaction and the, every request that came in spawned 40 parallel threads executing 40 services that then went off and made 3,000 calls to H2, 21,000 calls to Oracle. Not very efficiently done, okay? Basically, every request that came in here consumed 41 threads on that JVM and for 1.1 minutes. So that means this JVM is blocked with a couple of requests because all the threads are consumed and they're just waiting the way it was implemented. Key metrics that I'm always looking at is the number of service calls, the payload of service calls. Why payload? Because if you start hosting your services in different types of clouds and then they communicate with each other, Amazon is not giving this away for free, but they charge by not only CPU, but also transfer, data transfer. So that's why you have to be very, you should be very careful and monitor how much data you really transfer. Also the number of involved threads. So I've seen example like even in this case, these, there were 41 threads consumed and blocked for 1.1 minutes. This is not, 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 a, not a, an efficient way of doing it. And, and then basically the one plus N, the problem pattern we've seen before in the database, I just see a whole shift from app server to database, now service to service. The, end, the same, the same pat the pattern applies. Tooling, same as before. The next one, where's my water? We can log this, okay? I think I mentioned this in the morning that uh, it seems uh, we wanna give more power to Splunk and Elk and all the others, especially Splunk. For Splunk, it's not only more power, but also more money because Splunk is a great tool, but it can get very expensive if because they charge by how many log files, the size of log files they analyze, uh, great tools. Um, what I see, however, though, more often is this when logging becomes your performance hotspot. And I had a brief example in the very beginning of my first presentation. Again, this here is what we call the method hotspot. It shows me which methods actually consume most of the time. The second one right after the socket stream, which is normally the hotspot on an I.O. perspective in a web application because you're writing stuff back I.O. to the end user, uh, was call appenders. And if you look down, this is basically click on it, and then on the bottom you see the reverse call stack. You could see where these log statements actually came in, and it was all coming in from Spring. What they did, they turned on a lot of verbose logging in Spring, which made sense for one of the developers at some point in time, but they never turned it back off. So that basically moved all the way into the next phases. And then they were wondering why, A, everything is slower, B, why our disks are filling up and why Splunk is now stopping analyzing data because we're constantly running out of the amount of data we purchased from Splunk. But the biggest problem is that a third of the time was just spent in, in logging. Second example, again, Log4j. In this case, uh, the top problem, really call it pandas was the number one problem and it's a little hard to see here we show you how much time a method spends on CPU in I.O. in wait or in a sync block. And in this case, most of the time was actually spent in call appenders 
in sync. Why? Does anybody know the internals of log4j, especially some of the older versions? So in old, they used an older version of, of, of log4j and they also had their both logging turned on. And basically when mul basically the, this version of, of log4j had a huge synchronization issue if multiple threads tried to write to the same appender. So basically trying to write log files. So the more load they had, the more these threads were waiting on each other to be able to write to the log files. And again, I like this too because you just immediately see what the problem is and who is calling it. So key metrics that I'm always looking at the number of log entries and also the size of logs per use case. And I'm not sure, do you, who of you is actually, do you have uh, some standards on what you log and what not to log? Do you do log reviews? Does anybody do log reviews? With log review I mean you execute your use case and then look at the logs produced and then you mark the lines that actually make sense. And typically the lines that actually make sense are very few, okay? Good, so now I come to a uh, next use case that I have to introduce with one of my, with an image from one of my most favorite shows, which I'm sure is also true here. <laughs> okay. Who does not know this guy? Really? You're avoiding Game of Thrones? <laughs> oh, but you are definitely an outlier here because you're the only one. I see another guy that's there. Three, Game of Thrones. So those of you that know him, he was, well, fortunately, he is no longer with us, first of all. <laughs> yeah, but I don't spoil it for the two people that have managed to ignore Game of Thrones for so long. So, <laughs> so what I see here, this guy obviously was put on the throne and sometimes I would say he was deployed on the throne. <laughs> And sometimes deployments just go bad. Uh, the next is an example from an e-commerce platform. It's like an eBay. So there are people that can put products on there and then the people that buy it, okay? Richard, you are now my producer. Uh, you are, you are selling products, and what's your name? Philip. Philip, Philip you are buying, okay? So what you're seeing here is in the US, there is a very key selling period that starts around Thanksgiving, or actually after Thanksgiving, and then the Monday afterwards is called Cyber Monday, the biggest thing in, in, the w in, in the year. And on this platform, they were testing both use cases. You were putting products on and then executing a report at the end of the day saying, how many products did I sell to Philip or to whoever else? They used Load Runner in their load testing environment to test your use case, I mean all use cases, but your use case of getting the report at the end of the day took 42 seconds to execute. Now I need to look here, it's even hard for me to see. 38 seconds on this JVM and it made 1,600 database calls, okay, to get your report. They gave the thumbs up and said, we're two weeks before Thanksgiving, we don't wanna mess around with this because Richard, you are not as much as important as he because you're actually making the money by buying stuff. And if you have to wait 42 seconds at the end of the day to get your report, that's okay. They put this thing in production and then, and then really tested with, with more volume that they had on Cyber Monday. However, this is what, hap what happened. On Cyber Monday, your report now took eight minutes or actually six minutes, eight times slower, six minutes to execute, and it was executing 5,200 SQL statements. Yeah. Strange, even though with less load overall on the system. Does anyone want to take a guess on what could have been the difference between the test environment and the production environment? Why do we see different behavior? The data is different, data is different? yeah, because Nobody knew, how could, everybody any, how could anybody know that more and more people put products online? So basically they took, they took test data from the year before and they did not anticipate that the, the products sold online and people like you putting products on there actually increase by 50%. Different data. That means a data-driven problem. Last year you had 3,000 uh, products to sell, this year 5,000. And the way it was implemented was the M plus one query problem. First problem. Second problem, 
is a little hard to guess. So here's what we did. I want to show you because what, what else was wrong. This is, uh, again, the layer breakdown. You know, we look at layers, where is most of the time spent, web requests, Hibernate, web services, JDBC, and so on. And this was in the test environment. And in the test environment, the topmost component were web requests doing I.O. And that's normal, because typically, most of the time should be spent in sending out data. The same report in production looked totally different. Now the hotspot was Hibernate, class loading, custom monkey, and another XML library. So what really what happens was the following. If we click on this guy, what we see is what are the top methods contributing from Hibernate? Actually, it was Java Lang class get interfaces being called from the Hibernate's field interception helper. And this had a huge performance impact. And it was not only because of the data volume, but because two days before Thanksgiving, the guy who is responsible for the app said, we need to upgrade our Hibernate library. We need to upgrade to the latest version that we have not tested. <laughs> so basically, they put, a they put a product in production that was not tested. And unfortunately, they picked a version of Hibernate that had a well-known performance bug. Because what they did, field interception, you go to Google field interception helper, reflection performance problem, the first thing you find is a Jira ticket in the Hibernate project saying well-known performance bug. But they were stressed, and they thought we need to upgrade. The second thing, what they also did, they swapped their XML parser. At the same, they, at the same, the same guy made also a decision to, to switch to different XML parser because he read somewhere that this is much better than the one we had before. That, however, in their use case, had a total different performance behavior than what the blog post they wrote uh, read. Okay. Lesson learned here is only put into production what you really have tested, and not make a huge change, even though it just seems like you're just updating a library and not a code, but if a library is part of your deployment too. Another example, and as you can see, I really like Game of Thrones. Um, what I want to express with this here is uh, don't count on the fact that you have endless resources. Okay, Like you don't always have an army and dragons that can help you. Um, I got a question for you, and I'm showing you now two charts. One, the top one is response time, and the bottom one is um, load on the system. So the top is response time of an application. It is a two hour period. It's hard to see, but this is noon, 12 o'clock. This is when a new deployment was made. So basically version one, and then version two got deployed. The question for you now is, well, if you look at this chart, do you think this was a successful deployment from a performance perspective? Yes, no, there's no, I mean, there's, there's a wrong answer. Well, actually, there's, no, there's no wrong answer. So this is, this, is, this is the load. So basically, it was similar load before and after the deployment. And if you look at the response time, it also looks very similar. Here we had a little hiccup, obviously, with the, the you, you think it's good? I think so, too. If I look at these numbers, I think response time did not degrade, same as before. So I would go home and say, thanks, that's my weekend. However, what they did not look at and what they learned is that with this new deployment, all of a sudden, they have four times as high of a CPU consumption and 40% more memory usage, which caused Amazon to send them emails saying, we now need to bill you a little bit more or their data center. So basically, this deployment, even though it looked like good from a response time perspective, actually was huge in a huge problem on the resource side. And what was interesting, again, this is a uh, this is a .NET example, but it's the same for Java. We are looking here at garbage collection runs in the different generations or in the different uh, heap sizes. So we could immediately see after the deployment the number of GCs in the Eden space, generation zero, went up like crazy. 
and also the time spent in garbage collection went up like crazy. It turned out that they had a dependency injection library and at some point between when any code change that made it into that release, they made a change into the dependency library that the controller objects that they had used to be around 20 kilobytes of size, now they were 116 kilobytes of size and they also had twice as many objects on the heap because of a configuration change in the dependency library. And what was interesting is they never looked at resource consumption in any of their builds that they tested. They only looked at response time. So what they had to do, they had to go back in time. This was their bad build and their team had to go back in time and test all the builds and figure out when was this change introduced. It took them two weeks to figure out that it was the dependency library, the dependency injection rules. So the lesson learned for me is not only look at performance, a response time when you talk about performance. It's also about resources. Because if it takes twice as much CPU, then it's not a good change that you just installed. Um, just some other, I mean, uh, this was a, a .NET example. Uh, for, for Java here, I have a screenshot uh, of a JVM. And what you see here is on the top left, Eden space, survivor space, old generation. You can see the old generation is growing, 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 growing. Then we can see starting garbage collection kicking in pretty heavily. At the same time when garbage collection kicks in, the number of transactions that are processed by that machine obviously drops almost to zero because garbage collection is hitting the machine pretty hard. You see the impact of garbage collection. And what we can see here, just and also this is something that I sent back to one of my users that sent me that data. And I tried to explain what I see. And I say, well, it seems that the Eden space overall stays constant, all the objects get propagated into the next spaces. And basically until your old generation fills up and then because you have a, a heap size of 3.5 gigabyte every time when then the garbage collector kicks in, that has a, a whole lot of impact to clean up all the memory. Okay, so, oops. so please, I know this Typically questions then come up, so what is a good m a memory strategy or what's good garbage collection setting? There's no golden rule because it always depends on your application and what type of memory allo allocation patterns you have and which demands you have. Do you have a cache in there? Yes, no. You look at uh, cache lifetime settings and stuff like that. There's great books online um, and, and a great material to read up on. So key metrics. Uh, the number of objects per generation, I always look at that. The number of GC runs and also the impact that the garbage collector has on your on your application. Okay. Good. I got a couple more minutes, and I just want to end the whole thing with some tips and tricks. Uh, I think what I'm always trying to do is when you when you have the chance and really do load testing, and there's different types of load tests that you can run. You can run a steady state load test, figuring out is the state of the application stable, and we don't have a memory leak. Another thing that I always like is an increasing load test. So you start with a user and then scale it up and see when the application breaks. Or figuring out which component breaks in your app. What you see here is again a similar view I had before. We call it the layer breakdown. So over the course of the load test where I don't show the number of users, but the number of users basically started from zero and then slightly went up. I can see it around here. This layer starts to exponentially become slower and becomes my bottleneck. So if I look at these layers, as I said before, Hibernate, Spring, my web service one, my web service two, you can see with increasing load, which of my layers is scaling and is not scaling. And in this case, this was a faulty caching library that had an issue under when they hit a certain threshold where people try to access that cache and then it basically fell apart. Okay, this is great to do. At least that's what I always do. So another, another thing is I always look at of exceptions, of really exception objects being created and thrown even though they never make it to any log file. You would be surprised if you look at actually how many exception objects are created by Hibernate, by Spring and by all the other frameworks and are handled internally to fall back to some default implementation. If you forget certain properties to set, a lot of exceptions are thrown internally. And what I always do, I always look at the number of exceptions being thrown and I compare it with the number of log messages. This should correlate. If it does not correlate, it typically means you made a configuration change in a framework 
and now the framework is going crazy and throwing a lot of exceptions internally, even though you may not see it in a log file. Also what I do is the same thing with load and uh, failed responses. So at some point in time when you increase the load, the number of, the percentage number of failed transactions will go up. So you know the breaking point of your app. When do we start to throw HTTP 400s and 500s? I also look at database activity. I'm looking at the average number of SQL statements being called under load and also the total number. Why? The average number of SQL executions over time should not go up. If it goes up over time, you know you have a data-driven performance problem because the n plus, plus one query problem, if that goes up. And the, the, the total sum should also kind of flatten out. Why? Because more and more data should potentially end up in caches. Okay, so these are the things that I'm looking at. Also, from a database perspective, uh, how many statements are prepared or unprepared? And what's very interesting for me as well, I always look at how many select, insert, and delete statements are executed. So if I, for instance, see that there's a spike in here, and this might be at a time when somebody ran a very heavy report or maybe cleaned up a database, database table, then I immediately see, oh, something happened here. Okay, so that's why I always try to break it up into these types. And I think the last one is uh, connection pools, uh, not only DB connection pools, but also thread pools. Make sure that your, that your pools are correctly configured. What I see a lot and what also happened to us in our community, we had Apache uh, in front of Confluence and the Apache uh, uh, Tomcat connector didn't have the correct thread, outgoing thread settings as the incoming Tomcat side. And basically we were just, at the connector just waited and never passed on the connections to, to, uh, to, to the backend com uh, Tomcat. Yeah, connection pools as well. Just make sure that you're not maxing them out. If you are using a lot of connections, make sure you might be more efficient or maybe you need to increase them. More blog, oh yeah, more, more stories obviously on our blog if you want to. And I told you that, that I'm, I have a t-shirt challenge for you. For those of you that wanna get a t-shirt, how sexy is this one? Um, the first 10, well, we have some out there for people that actually make it to our booth and then talk with my colleagues. Um, but if you are interested, again, this is free for you, Dynatrace. Get the tool, install it on your app, and send me a pure pass. Okay, and if you do it until tomorrow, as long as I'm here, and don't, customers are not allowed to send me pure pass of their production environment because you already have it installed. I look at the timestamp and I know when you registered. <laughs> okay, so let's. I hope this was useful, some tips and tricks, some metrics. Not only analyze them manually, but think about the stuff that I told in the morning, hook it up with your tests that you already have and find problems early. Okay, questions? I think we got two more minutes. We have the time, okay. Then, then we have questions later on at the panel. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Andy.